Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Understanding the Real Cost of ACH Payments, brought to you by IOFM and sponsored by Envoice Pay. We have a few housekeeping notes to go over before we get started. If you have any technical questions or issues using the webinar platform, please use the chat box and I will respond right away. If you have any issues with the audio, please click the phone icon located above the chat window to receive the teleconference information. For those that do need to call in to ensure call quality, everyone's lines have been muted today. But we do encourage you to ask questions throughout the webinar. Please type your questions into the chat box and hit send to submit them. And at the end of the webinar, we will have our presenters answer questions. If we're not able to get to all questions, we will respond post-webinar via email. We will also have four polling questions during this webinar. A pop-up box will appear when we run each poll. Please choose from the multiple choice answers and hit submit. We would love your participation and insight today. If you happen to get disconnected from the webinar, you can log on again using the instructions provided in your webinar confirmation email. But if you continue to experience difficulty, please email webinars at iofm.com and we will respond right away. This webinar will be recorded and you'll receive a thank you email with the on-demand materials, which will include the link to today's recording and a PDF handout link. Um, these items will be in your inbox within the next two business days. Our speakers for today are Mark Rousseau and Josh Cyphers. Mark, uh, Mark has over 26 years of ex uh, and has established himself as a thought leader on accounts payable, accounts receivable, payments, and document automation. A popular speaker at industry conferences on, and on webinars and podcasts, Brousseau advises prominent end users and solutions and services providers on how to use automation to improve document and payment driven business processes. Brousseau has chaired numerous educational conferences and, and has served on several industry committees and boards. He resides in Center City, Philadelphia with his wife and three sons. Josh, Josh Cyphers is the Director of Financial Planning and Analysis at Invoice Pay. For over 20 years, Josh has provided global business and financial planning leadership for large enterprises, including Nike and Microsoft. He has also led treasury management and financial analysis functions in various roles. A consultant and former CPA, Josh has deep experience developing profit profitable growth strategies, actionable business intelligence, and competitive and market analysis throughout a broad range of industries. And at this time, I would like to welcome our speakers and hand it off to Mark. Laura. Thank you so much, Laura, and thank you all for joining us today. So in 2019, automating your payments to suppliers is likely a top priority for your accounts payable department. And your first inclination might be to push as many of those payments as possible from paper checks to ACH. Seems like a no-brainer, right? Well, there might be some reasons that that's not the right approach, and that's the focus of today's webinar. We're going to show you the real cost of ACH payments and talk about why your best approach might be a holistic one. But before we do all that, we want to start with a poll question, which is about to be displayed in your screen. We want to know, what percentage of supplier payments does your organization currently make electronically? Do you pay all of them electronically? Is it 90% to 99% of your supplier payments that are made electronically? Is it 75% to 90%? 50% to 75%, 25% to 50%. 1% to 25% or do you pay them all via paper check? Take a moment to respond to the poll question now displayed on your screen. We're going to discuss the results in just a moment. So Josh, when I talk to AP leaders, they tell me that payments are a big priority for their organization. Where are we today with electronic payments in most organizations? What, what types of businesses are doing 
better? Which ones have a lot of work to do? Yeah, thanks, Mark. There, there is quite a big push to get off check. Unfortunately, we still see a lot of companies um, doing 100% check or doing mostly check. It's been, it's been difficult to adopt ACH, and I think we'll get into those reasons. Um, some that have tried ACH went back to check. So I think we still have a long ways to go, but I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic that we'll be able to get there. What's the biggest motivator for organizations to get off those paper checks, Josh? I'd say it's really around cost savings and trying to, to just cut out the manual processes associated with, co with the check costs. The other part is a lot of suppliers are demanding electronic payment and really don't want to receive a check in the mail as part of their, their payment. Now, some folks on the line are in AP, and they're probably thinking to themselves, right this moment, Josh, well, why should I be managing this, this transformation? Maybe, maybe I should just let finance or Treasury take care of this. Why does AP have such a vested interest in what happens with supplier payments? I think there's a couple, couple points to, to your question, Mark. One is the cost, obviously, and the time spent doing checks. But if they've worked out a really efficient check payment process, the other one I would, I would put in there is really the opportunity to be a strategic partner to Treasury and procurement and helping with supplier relationships, helping kind of maximize our offset costs through early payments and those sort of things. So I think AP really has an opportunity here to be a, a kind of more strategic player in the finance organization and kind of help up-level their, their group. Josh, we asked our attendees what percentage of their payments to suppliers are made electronically. 23% of the folks on the line tell us that between 1% and 20% of their payments to suppliers are made electronically. 21% said between 75 and 90% of their checks and 20% uh, payments, and 20% of the folks on the line said between 50% and 70% of their payments are made electronically. Quick tabulation here shows that 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 a lot of folks are still making a lot of payments via paper checks, Josh, this clearly doesn't surprise you. Yeah, I was trying to quickly do the math in my head. It looks like almost half the respondents um, are 50% or le less electronic. And that's kind of the point I'm, I was trying to make, Mark. Uh, it's, it's still a big problem. Uh, manual check processing is still a big thing. Yeah, more than a quarter of the folks on the line here are, are, are doing basically very few um, electronic payments. What's your message to them today? What's the key thing for these folks who have the longest road to hoe? I, you know, I always think about taking a holistic payment strategy, giving the supplier choices, understanding kind of the costs and benefits both on the their side, the AP side, or or the buyer side, as well as the supplier side and what the supplier is dealing with and looking at. Um, there's a again a lot of opportunity to work with Treasury and procurement in, in kind of rounding out that holistic payment strategy. But hopefully, some of the things I talk about today will will give folks a, a better appreciation for what I mean. Indeed, let's do another poll question. We want to know what is the main barrier to getting your suppliers signed up for electronic payments? Is it that is it that you don't have the financial budget to do it? Is it that your suppliers won't take electronic payments? They love checks. Is it that this simply isn't a business priority for your organization? Or is it electronic payment implementation takes too much time and too many resources, and who has enough of that? Take a moment to respond to the poll question now displayed on your screen. We're going to discuss the results in just a moment. So, Josh, why has this taken so darn long for corporate America to get off of paper checks? After all, consumers have basically gone electronic. Why can't businesses do it? You know, I was looking at the poll question, Mark, and I think we're missing the fifth option, which is all of the above. I think AP has a lot going on. There's a, there's a lot around controlling payments, the importance of controlling and making sure payments are going to the right vendor at the right time making sure obligations are met so that suppliers are delivering and, and really facilitating the growth and productivity of the business. AP plays a really important role there, but it's, it's not an easy thing to do on your own. Um, and there's already, and I'll go through that a little bit, there's already a lot that AP is worried about and, and facing day to day. Well, these folks have fallen right into our trap here, Josh, because the number one response to why it is they 
can't get their suppliers to take electronic payments is that they say their suppliers like paper checks. 44% mm. of you blame your suppliers for your lack of progress in getting off paper checks. 24% of you say electronic implementation takes too much time and too much money. 29% of you say this isn't a business priority. All right, Josh, let's dispel this right away. Suppliers like electronic payments, don't they? They do, given it's the right kind of electronic payment with the right information that they can reconcile back to their systems. Far too often, electronic payments fall short on remittance information. That's why they like check. Check always comes with the nice report that ties out to the total that's on the check that lists each invoice that's being paid, and that's, that's what creates efficiencies and for, for the suppliers. What we found, if we're able to provide those suppliers with, with better um, electronic remittance information that they, they would never want to take check again. They would only want electronic. Josh, these folks did such a great job with these two poll questions. Let's do one more. Yeah. We want to know. We want to know, what is your organization's biggest challenge in paying suppliers using ACH? So now, not just electronic payments, think about ACH in particular. Is it onboarding suppliers? Is it managing payment data? Is it managing another payment portal? Is it higher than anticipated costs? Is it cumbersome reconciliation? Is it fraud? Is it all the above? Or is it something else? Take a moment to respond to the poll question. Now display your screen, and we're going to discuss the results in just a moment. On that previous poll question was a response, I can't let go, Josh. I noticed that nearly a third of the folks on the line say that electronic payments are not a priority for their business. Talk some sense to these people, will you? <laughs> well, it, like I said, AP has a lot going on, and they're faced with bigger challenges. And so, don't let things, them off the hook, Josh. Don't let them things, do it. <laughs> and and so it it is difficult to do it on your own. And unfortunately, even if you have a good banking relationship, banks aren't real customer service focused, and they don't want to help you through the process. It's important to find a good solution partner who, who really is, is interested in your supplier base and your, your processes and really helps you kind of go to that next level in terms of automation so you can focus on the more important and bigger challenges you have. So let's be clear here. Electronic payments should be a priority for your organization. They, sh they should be if you want to save costs. We asked our attendees, what is their organization's biggest challenge in moving to ACH? 31% of the folks on the line, Josh, said onboarding suppliers. 9% said it's managing payment data. No surprise there. 5% said managing another payment portal or cumbersome reconciliation. 3% said higher than anticipated costs. 4% of them said fraud. But look at this. A quarter of the folks on the line, Josh, it's all of the above. We're having a lot of issues with moving to ACH. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is why we're doing our webinar today. So when we look at where it is organizations are when it comes to paying their suppliers, paper check is still the most frequent way that businesses are paying their suppliers, particularly in small to mid-sized businesses. IOFM data tells us that on average, businesses make 39% of their supplier payments via a paper check. But if you're a small business, chances are good that you're making all or nearly all of your supplier payments with a paper check. This has come down a long way from just a few years ago when 60% of all payments to suppliers were made with paper check. So we've made progress, but many would argue that it's not fast enough. And the recipient of most of that volume that's moved off of paper checks, well, it is indeed ACH, Automated Clearing House Transactions, along the lines of how it is you get paid each week for direct deposit. Now, we all know that when you're paying suppliers with paper checks, it is an expensive affair. Our friends at NACHA tell us that paper checks cost 30 times or more as much as electronic alternatives such as ACH and virtual cards. And this makes perfect sense. 
think about everything that goes in to making those paper check payments. You got to collect, store, maintain information on your suppliers. You got to print, sign, mail paper checks. You got to log into multiple bank portals. You got to manage multiple payment systems. You have high bank fees. You have to replace the inevitable lost checks. You have to respond to all those supplier payment inquiries, reconcile payments and invoices, add temporary staff as your volume increases. And yes, you're going to suffer a lot of fraud losses. It's inevitable. Paper checks are responsible for 10 times as much fraud as their electronic alternatives. And it's even greater when you compare paper checks to virtual cards. What's more, paper checks waste an enormous amount of staff time. And Josh said it right. We just don't have time in AP to be managing more paper processes. 84% of the typical accounts payable practitioner's time is wrapped up in activities around heads down transaction processing. This is exactly the opposite of what senior management wants your team focused on. So if you're trying to find ways to free up your staff to focus on those value added activities that drive strategic initiatives, well, getting off paper checks is a good way to do it. And indeed, the tide is turning against paper checks. At long last, businesses have said, enough is enough. Three years from now, IOFM's Future of Accounts Payable Survey predicts that ACH volume will dwarf that of paper checks. Three years from now, businesses expect that 38% of all their supplier payments will be made with ACH, the inverse of today when and nearly the same percentage is made with paper check. What's more, paper checks will only represent 18% of all payments to suppliers. Now, rest assured, in small and mid-sized businesses, the percentage will be much higher. But directionally, well, the conclusion is inevitable. Businesses are making a big push toward electronic payments. And what jumps out here is that three years from now, Businesses anticipate that 16% of all their payments to suppliers are going to be made with virtual cards, those plasticless 16-digit transactions tied to a specific transaction or an amount or a supplier. And just a few years ago, virtual cards weren't even a thing, and yet businesses expect that they will represent nearly as large a percentage of their supplier payments as venerable paper checks. Now, why do we believe all this? Why do we think that this time businesses will finally quit paper checks? Well, it's because 70% of them have made it a business priority. They have a strategic plan in place to get off of paper checks. I believe them this time. And that means that if you don't have a plan in place, you're likely to fall behind your peers and maybe your competitors. So why is it that businesses are saying they've got to get rid of those paper checks? Well, the number one reason is that they recognize the costs associated with them. 48% of AP departments identify reduced operational costs as the reason for cutting their paper check volumes. We know that there's huge cost savings to be had when you can pay suppliers electronically. What's more, a quarter of AP departments cite faster cycle times as the biggest benefit of electronic payments. And that's across the life cycle of the payment. You're able to generate them more quickly, deliver them more quickly, and that helps eliminate supplier inquiries, mitigate fraud, improve reporting, manage your cash. The benefits go on and on. What's more, 6% of AP departments identify fewer errors and less fraud as the biggest benefit of electronic payments. Cost savings, faster cycle times, and fewer errors. What's not to like about electronic payments? Well, the cherry on the proverbial Sunday is that electronic payments help us complete that last mile of AP automation. For so long in the accounts payable space, we focused on invoice processing, inefficient in its own right. But organizations, as they push toward accounts payable automation, recognize that only after they automate electronic payments as well as their invoice processing, only then are they going to be able to have that true end-to-end -end efficiency and effectiveness that they're after. And that's going to be key if accounts payable departments are going to achieve the strategic value that they believe they can have in the organization. 
over the next three years, organizations expect that they're going to become more strategically important. And electronic payments are a great way to do that. They help you generate card rebates that deliver value to the enterprise. They help you capture more early payment discounts, with, which offset the cost of your department and help drive your move to becoming a profit center. And they create an opening for you to optimize your standard payment terms to suppliers so you can extend your day's payable outstanding. In fact, if you use certain card programs, you're able to instantly extend your DPO without changing your existing payment terms to a supplier. All of this, all of this, my friends, creates an environment where you're able to achieve financial benefits five times greater than if you were just to automate invoice processing by itself. Senior execs are watching. They know that there's value to automating electronic payments. They might be pushing your initiatives at this moment. Senior executives, such as the CFO and the controller, are expected to be nearly as big a champion for electronic payments automation as accounts payable leaders themselves. Now, that's not to say it's going to be smooth sailing. Departments say that they have challenges with a lack of resources, concerns about supplier adoption, in some cases a lack of senior management support, and in some cases, as our poll suggested, no strategy. But there's ways to make this happen if you use the right approach to electronic payments, that type of approach that Josh is going to talk about today. And if you do that, if you do that, folks, it's going to help you achieve improvements in the metrics that senior management cares most about. And that brings us to our next poll question which is about to be displayed in your screen. We want to know, what do you perceive as the biggest benefit of implementing a holistic payment approach? Not this one-off thing that so many of you have done in the past. A holistic payment approach. Is it ease of initiating payments? Is it higher supplier adoption of electronic payments? Is it more payment options for suppliers? Is it no need to manage payment data? Is it less risk of fraud? Is it all of the above? Or is it something else? Take a moment to respond to the poll question now displayed on your screen. We're going to discuss the results in just a moment. So, Josh, what's the number one reason that organizations are turning their backs in their banks and coming to organizations like yours for a holistic payments approach? You know, I would say it's, it's interesting because it gets back to the last poll question. It's really hard to set up suppliers for electronic payment. It takes some time. Um, you know, our company, not every company is like ours. Ours provides that service that so we do in supplier enablement and we've become really good at it. But it, it, it's very time consuming to, to make that switch. What advice would you give to the organization that today might be sitting on a huge pile of ACH transactions, or, or maybe even a huge pile of check payments, are they able to switch and go to a holistic approach, even if they're in, in, a, in a big way in one direction? Yeah, that's always a possibility. And, and really, it's about giving the suppliers choice and collaborating internally with your treasury and procurement department. Procurement departments deal with very similar things that AP does when it comes to supplier relations and payment, even payment methods, or dis discount, um, early payment discounts. Treasury cares about those things as well, and Treasury prefers that you pay by check and that you sit on that payment as long as you can. So they'll want to know what's the financial impact to move into electronic and be very concerned with that. We asked our attendees what did they perceive as the biggest benefit of a holistic approach to payments. 12% said ease of initiating payments. That's a Big benefit, 9% said more payment options for suppliers indeed. 6% said higher supplier adoption as well as less risk of fraud. Some of you even said no need to manage payment data. But look at this, Josh. Two-thirds of the folks on the line acknowledge that all of the above are benefits of a holistic approach to payments. And that sets us up nicely for Josh to explain why it is that you shouldn't rush into paying all your suppliers via ACH and a holistic approach is indeed the better approach. 
Josh? Thanks, Mark. Now, I appreciate the introduction. I appreciate um, the information you've shared. A lot of it resonates with me. And as you know, I'm a big fan of yours, so I'm just honored to be here speaking with you today. This is a topic I'm very passionate about, spent quite a bit of time researching. I work for a company that processes millions of payments every year to thousands of suppliers uh, for hundreds of, of enterprise companies. And I'm a financial analyst by trade. So I've spent the last 20 years at companies like Nike and Microsoft understanding the economic impact and, and benefits of, of certain business decisions. And being here has given me an opportunity to really try and understand what is the economic impact of, of doing payments. And as you can see from the poll question, the benefits are broad. There's several benefits. I think it's pretty, pretty easy to understand the benefits of going electronic and automating. What's, what's important to also consider are the costs. And that's really what I want to get into today. Right now, AP teams are bogged down. They have so many things going on, as I mentioned earlier. There's, there's complexities in, in trying to avoid sending money out to the wrong person and trying to ensure that the money goes to the right person in time. And it's a really important function in the organization. At the end of the day, CFOs, they rely on the AP organization for their own jobs so, that, so the money won't go to the wrong person um, or be unrecoverable. And that's a really important function. There's also an opportunity for AP to be strategic because the information and level of control that AP has and the insight into who's being paid and when they're being paid is really valuable information. And it's valuable control they have in the organization. So what I want to look at a little more are three main payment methods, as Mark showed in, in one of his previous slides. The ACH is really anticipated to be a big one. Um, so I want to talk more about that. Check is already big, but the shift is going to ACH, and that's where everyone's headed. Virtual card is another payment type that I would like to consider and kind of stack up next to the other payment types, because you saw in Mark's chart, 16% of respondents expect to go to virtual card in the future. And I think it's an important payment vehicle that a lot of companies aren't even familiar with today and that a lot, a lot of suppliers would prefer. So what are the considerations among these payment methods? Well, I've listed out three things that we should kind of drill deeper into. One of those is operating costs, and I think that's kind of the obvious one. Another one is error and fraud risk, and the third one is potential to offset costs. So looking across here, having a holistic payment strategy is really about understanding these three factors of the payments and what the supplier preferences are and why. Check, as we know, operating costs are very high. Everyone wants to move off them, but they haven't been able to. And that's the strategy, and so we got to figure out how can we make that happen. The error and fraud risk, Mark mentioned, I think it was 10x more fraud on check than any other payment method. It is historically the highest potential for error and fraud. So what are the opportunities to offset costs in check? Possibly early payment terms, although a lot of suppliers who get early payment terms will want to receive the cash much sooner than they'll receive the check. Uh, another one, and you'll hear this a lot from your Treasury Department, is there's quite a bit of value in, in check flows. And a lot of Treasury Departments depend on that working capital um, that they receive by you paying by check. So what about ACH? ACH is the one I want to talk about. The operating costs seem low. Listening to NACHA, reading your bank statement, you may think it's only five to 10 cents per ACH, but I want to get into really what the costs are around all that. Uh, some banks actually offer ACH fees uh, for free. Uh, they don't even charge a cost. And you'll start to understand why and, and how that isn't, doesn't necessarily mean that the costs are going to be low. What about error and fraud risk? If check fraud is so high, is ACH going to be better? Well, it is better today, but we're seeing an increase in the amount of fraud, and I'll talk a little more about that. Uh, with social engineering and, and all, all the kind of internet and technology uh, hackers out there and bad actors, there's an in increase in the, the, the fraud on ACH because someone has to store that bank information. And we found companies get exposed by seem, vendors who seem to be the right person changing that bank information. So what are the opportunities to offset costs on ACH? The vendors receiving the money sooner than they would by check. And so there's an opportunity for early payment terms, but that's about it. The third one on virtual card is the operating costs are very low. You could find any number of vendors who will make these payments for you and even provide some automation upstream around approvals and other parts of your system. The other part is the error and fraud risk and really the control around a virtual card payment. You can change the amount. You don't have to reprocess or repay on credits and, and other type of payment scenarios. 
And so it's really secure and it's very much in your control and visibility. You also should expect to receive some sort of rebate um, when you pay by card, as you do with your Alaskan Air Miles card or, or any other plastic card you might be carrying around, um, you get reward points essentially uh, for what the network's providing in terms of the service on control and, and, and security. And so virtual card's an important consideration as well. Like I mentioned, today I really wanna focus on ACH and what those costs actually are. I've spent quite a bit of time researching this and I found very little industry research. One of the reports that was very pretty thorough, I found listed the cost of sending an ACH at about 37 to 75 cents per payment. That may seem high, especially if you're only paying 20 or 25 cents per payment um, on your bank statement, but there's other considerations in there. So there's internal costs, the bank transaction fees, but also, also uh, I'm sorry, those are the external costs. The internal costs are recording the personal time spent and any technology involved. And so there is time associated with sending payments. But that is just sending the payment. The other cost that I wanna talk about, and it was interesting to see the poll response, is there's a lot more going on when you go to electronic or when you're trying to manage an electronic payment program. The first one, and again, getting back to the poll question, is supplier setup. There's a lot involved there, and I'll get into it more. But there's verification of data, there's calls or emails with the suppliers, there's data management beyond that. Another cost that's important to consider are ACH failures and modifications. That 20 cents you're paying on your bank statement isn't what you'll pay if you have to stop or halt or change an ACH. Or if there's an error in your ACH batch or an error in your bank, the bank information on your ACH payment, your fees are gonna run much higher than that, more like 20 to $30. There's also the loss of check float. I mentioned that a little bit. Treasury really cares about that. ACH, you might get one day of float, check, maybe you're getting three to five, potentially even more days of float with check. And so that little amount of those few days does really impact your working capital and, and Treasury pays attention to that. The last thing to consider, and I won't get too deep into this because this is really hard to quantify, are the data risk, the increased supplier support and the remittance requirements. When you pay by check, you have a nice report that goes out with the check. When you pay by ACH, it, if, you're, if you've got a good system and process in place, maybe you're emailing separately remittance. Either way, you've got to come up with that remittance information um, and the suppliers are likely going to be calling and asking more questions. So let's go through an example to get to the hard dollars of what I mean when I say these additional costs of ACH. The example I'd like to use is a company that has 50,000 payments with about 5,000 suppliers that they pay. And that equates to about 250 million of annual AP spend or I think that's an average payment size, about 5,000 per payment. So this may seem big to you, it may seem small to you, but this is uh, a reasonable sample of, of a company that may be starting to put some efficiencies in place and may be close to best in class, but hasn't quite got there yet um, and still has some kind of manual or, or, or difficult processes to follow. On the other side of that, I wanna consider AP staff time at about $25 per hour. That's fully loaded, not including supervisor manager time, just the AP staff. Another assumption I think is important to center around are the three to five days on check float and the two and a half percent annual return on cash from float. And I'll show you what I mean by that and get into some quantification there. So this is where the data and the information on the slide get pretty dense. We're gonna go through the math and go through some very specific assumptions on this. So bear with me, I'll walk you through this and, and we'll get through it and get to the totals here shortly. The cost of sending an ACH at 37 to 75 cents per payment and 50,000 payments, your cost per year is gonna run between 20 or 40K. That's just sending the payment. The really th real big thing that we we should talk about is that supplier setup. So you're required to gather bank information, transit and routing numbers, bank account numbers, all sorts of information that you may or may not have a, an automated process in place or some sort of portal for your supplier to use to capture this. Either way, you need to contact the vendor, you need to get the information somehow, you need to store it in a secure location and ideally verify and maybe even perform a test payment. Not a, not a lot of companies have the bandwidth or the resources to do that. And sadly, as I mentioned earlier, bad actors use social engineering and they're trying to get at any bank information you have on your system. It's a scary thought to keep bank information for supplier payments on your own system. 
because these, these people are out there and they will try to get to that and find your big payments and then change that information. The other part is suppliers update information every few years and suppliers are continuously added and replaced. And so you're constantly doing this process of updating information, verifying information, and then just keeping it current so that your ACH payments don't fail. So what are the costs of supplier setup and data management? Well, I'll go through kind of the three pieces I look at when I think of these costs. The first one being the initial setup. So if you have 5,000 suppliers, I've assumed let's say you set up a third of those in the first year or just spread that 5,000 over three years. At $25 per hour, we've found that a lot of companies spend 20 to 30 minutes. In some cases, we've seen 60 to 90 minutes just setting up and verifying a supplier. So we'll assume 20 to 30 minutes, which is about $8 to $12. Of, of cost per supplier. For that 1,667 suppliers, there's another 14,000 to 20,000. Already we've almost met just the cost of sending a payment and we've only set up a third of our suppliers. The next part are the new and replacement suppliers. So hopefully your business is growing and you're adding suppliers and you're, you're, you're going gangbusters and you're, 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 you're in a good situation. What we've found is that about 10 to 20% um, of your suppliers will need to be replaced each year. Your, your procurement department or whoever it is who engages your suppliers will find new suppliers, and then about 10 to 20% will be added in addition to your existing supplier base. So if we just take 20% of the 5,000, that's another 1,000 suppliers you'll need to set up each year, and that's another $8,000 to $13,000 of cost. The third piece is ongoing supplier updates. So we've found that suppliers will update their information every three to five years. I assume 10% to 20% of your suppliers would update their information every year, and I think that's a pretty conservative assumption. But that's another 500 to 1,000 supplier records that you have to touch, verify, validate, and maintain. And it's a little quicker. It's not quite 20 to 30 minutes because you already have a supplier record, but it, it is about 10 to 15 minutes typically um, to, to do that and go through that process and ensure it's accurate. That's another 2,000 to 13,000. So just in the, the cost of setting up your supplier and initial management and maintenance of that data, that's $24,000 to $39,000 per year. That's more than the cost of sending the ACH. But there's more, <laughs> and we'll keep going through those. So the next part is what if an ACH goes bad? What if you have a failure or you need to change an ACH or you find something out that's not right or you have something you need to add to it? What if something happens? Research suggests that 1% to 3% of ACH payments fail or have errors. Even more than that, maybe something you need to change or supplier information you need to update after you've already sent the ACH to your bank. It may not seem like a lot, but as you'll see in the numbers I go through, that adds, adds up pretty quickly. Uh, whole batches can fail with one error. So if you have a batch payment you're sending through ACH, maybe it's 100 different payments, so you have one error, all of a sudden the whole batch fails and you need to re-investigate and resubmit. Even worse, if you have an error that's processed, and let's say that error is non-recoverable, either because you had a bad actor change the bank account information, or because you just put in the wrong thing or the wrong vendor for that payment, and that payment's not being very responsive after you've already sent it. There's not a lot of opportunity with ACH to pull those payments back, and you've got to be pretty quick, if you're able at all, to recover a lot of those ACH payments. Most likely, you'll reach out to the supplier, you have good suppliers, you've checked, and and have talked with the supplier's procurements, negotiated, and has good contact into the supplier um, organization. And so you have a discussion and you go through and you, and you end up in a real manual process of receiving those funds back, but that can be very time consuming. So sadly, around ACH and, and ACH failures, banks charge extra, and banks don't really care if you messed up. In fact, they make more money off of it. So you'll what I, would, what I would encourage you to do is not just look at the per ACH fee, but then go down the list a little bit longer on your bank statement and look how much they charge you to modify an ACH or change a payment or to cancel a payment. It, it can get pretty expensive. As I mentioned before, ACH is difficult to recover when the wrong payments go out. The other part that I think over, gets overlooked quite a bit that I found in my research is suppliers tend to have more questions when they receive an ACH. As we talked about before, with a check payment, you get the remittance in a report attached to the check. It's all bundled together and it's easy to apply that to your accounting system. When you receive an ACH payment, you might just see a line in your bank account and maybe who it's from. But then you've got to figure out, okay, well, what payments 
what invoices should I apply those payments to? And so they're usually more suppliers calling. I know in my experience, I've had several calls with Fortune 500 companies over ACH payments and it's gotten to points where I haven't been able to reconcile and had to write off thousands of dollars that we thought we received or thought we hadn't received, but they thought we had. And because we didn't have that remittance information and couldn't reconcile all that out, we just had to eat the cost. So let's go through the math on ACH failures. Like I mentioned before, on average, research suggests about one to 3% of ACH payments will fail. In this example, I'm gonna assume the number of occurrences are one to 2% on the 50,000 payments. So 500 to 1,000 payments. Well, the, the time that we found it, it takes to, to recover and to discuss and investigate and research and follow up and maybe even talk to the supplier on an ACH failure is about 60 to 90 minutes. It can be very time consuming. And so if you have great processes in place, but something breaks within your process, that's where you're gonna end up spending the most time. And this is a perfect example of that. At $25 per hour, 60 to 90 minutes, it's about 25 to 38 bucks per failure. For 500 to 1,000 payments, there's another 13,000 to 38,000 per year that ACH is gonna cost you. And then there are the external costs. As I mentioned, banks charge a pretty hefty fee just to change or modify an ACH or cancel an ACH. If you have to engage with the bank to get more information, which sometimes you do, they'll even charge you hourly fees. I haven't assumed that in here as I'm trying to keep this somewhat conservative and tilted a little bit towards best practices in terms of the ACH costs. So $25 to $30 at one to 2% of your payments, 500 to 1,000 payments, that's another 13 to $30,000 in costs that you may not even see or have account of. So that brings the, the ACH failures and modification costs up to 25 to $68,000 per year, just for ACH failures and modifications. The third thing I wanna talk about, and I mentioned this earlier, is check float. And we'll get into the math in a little bit. Treasury sees the value in float on check. Your treasurer, if you have one, is likely gonna be very interested if you're considering an electronic payment program. It's important to engage with that treasurer with the right information and to be proactive about bringing treasury in to help you understand what opportunity costs are you losing by paying electronic methods versus check. And treasurer is interested in ensuring adequate liquidity. They're interested in mitigating cash risk, but they're also interested in managing the cost of capital and that's why that check float becomes so, so important. But there are other alternatives to that in, by paying electronically that you may not be able to take advantage of by paying by check. So let's go through the math on check float. As I mentioned, we're gonna assume about three to five days of disbursement float. As you can see here, there's the approved for payment. Once it's approved for payment, then the check sent, check received, check entered and deposited, check clear. So there's, that kind of adds up to your three to five. I, mean, I realize the range may be, vary from company to company, but that's a pretty kind of standard kind of check payment um, float. If your average daily balance from float, I'm sorry, if your total AP spend is 250 million as it is in our example, your average daily balance from float with two to four days of lost check float, because you still get one day on ACH, is gonna be about 1.4 to 2.7 million. That's working capital and investable cash that Treasury will no longer have access to. And assuming you're not paying your bills off debt, you're not in a net debt situation, and that you're actually investing your idle cash in very low risk funds, your, your cost of capital is gonna be about 2.5%, 2 to 3% um, annually on that, on that lost working capital, on that 1.4 to 2.7 million. And with interest rates on the rise in recent times, that, that's becoming an even greater concern for, for treasury departments. So what's the cost of that? That's about 34,000 to 68,000 in lost costs if you've switched all your checks over to ACH. So let's add all those up. I know I went through a lot of math, I went through a lot of details, and we're going through quite a few things. There's even more beyond that, but let's just quickly add up what I've covered here so far. The cost of sending the payment, 19,000 to 38,000. The cost of setting up your suppliers, verifying and managing the data, 24,000 to 39,000. ACH failures and modifications, another 25 to 68,000 per year. And the loss of check float, 34,000 to 68,000. 
What I didn't cover, and again, it's hard to quantify, are the data risks, the increased supplier support, and those additional remittance requirements that suppliers will tend to have. So your AP staff's gonna be even more bogged down with electronic payments if there's not some supplier support involved in the solution you're seeking or if there's not something that, that gives them as good of remittance information as they get with check. There's also an element to this that I haven't quantified and that's potential for fraud. Fraud's a funny thing. If it hasn't impacted you yet, you probably don't care a lot about it. If it has impacted you as it has me, you might be a little more interested to try and quantify that. The risk is still real and it's still there. And so it's important to take that into account when evaluating your different check or different payment methods and, and really approaching a holistic payment strategy. So the, what I see as the total cost of ACH, and again, I believe this is conservative. I think there's a lot on top of this that I haven't included, but ACH payments, for a 50,000 payment company and 5,000 suppliers will cost about $100,000 to $200,000 a year. Some of that's internal, some of that's not on the books, some of that's in check float, but it's still a real cost or real economic impact to your organization if you're just purely going to electronic and you're doing it on your own, or if you're even doing it with your bank. That results in about $20 to $43 per supplier. And what we've seen on the procurement side is quite a few procurement folks and supplier managers have started charging suppliers for doing electronic payment or for just being a supplier and getting their portal or whatever information they get as a supplier in their organization. They charge $50 to $75 a year just to be a supplier for that organization. The reason they do that is to cover costs, but they're really not covering the costs it takes to, to pay the supplier. So what's the solution? So I've kind of hinted at it a couple times before. When you're, when you're, it's important to consider a holistic payment strategy and consider all your payment options. Engage with treasury, engage with procurement. Really try and understand what the supplier needs are because not every supplier is created equally and, and has the same needs. It's important to go through this and understand the risks the benefits and the opportunity to offset costs among each payment method. I've talked in quite a bit of detail about the cost of ACH, and I think that's the first place to start. I think you should also investigate virtual card. There are a fair number of your suppliers who will want to accept virtual card, are willing to, and are set up in their business to do so. And it's a great way for you to make a payment for your supplier to receive it earlier, and for all of that to be more controlled and secure, and also take you off check flow, or take you off check, sorry. So developing your strategy, don't go alone. You should always engage with someone else. I mentioned treasury and procurement, they're great internal resources, but you should find the right solution provider to help you do it. And I'm here to tell you the bank's probably not gonna be it. They're just gonna wanna charge you more fees and they're gonna make it difficult. They're not gonna wanna take responsibility for your bank information, or I'm sorry, your supplier's bank information, and they, you know, they're not gonna assist in setting up your suppliers. Even if they do, most likely they won't assist in maintaining that supplier information. Let invoice pay assume all the costs and risk of those payment types so you don't have to. That's what we do. That's why we're here. We found a real niche in doing all the work that I talked about and providing that as a service to organizations, and we've been very successful doing it. So what is invoice pay solution? Well, we, we take, we've taken that holistic payment strategy approach, and we've looked at organizations, as I mentioned, hundreds of enterprises across many industries, and we've really nailed down what needs to happen, what needs to be done. And we found that with our solution, we've been able to automate the payment process, automate your multiple levels of approval or your multiple entity approvals, get real-time payment statuses through a, a really easy to use UI that shows you where payments are, rather than trying to dig through bank statements or dig through your bank account statement online. Invoice Pay has taken all that and put it together and really coupled it with what is at the heart of Invoice Pay's service and solution, and that's caring about your data and caring about your suppliers. Invoice Pay tracks on a regular basis supplier satisfaction, and, and those suppliers and, and getting them paid on time and in the right way is, is, is really key to our business. And so Invoice Pay's solution is all about managing your data securely, making sure there aren't bad actors getting to your information, making sure you're not holding bank information in your own systems, and then automating so much for you um, that you can focus on those more strategic and, and, and more important higher risk areas of your business that we talked about earlier.
And with that, I'll turn it over to Laura. Thank, thank you, you so Mark much. And Thank you, Mark and Josh, for a great webinar. Um, we do have time for some questions. Just a reminder to um, enter your questions into the chat box and hit send to submit them. We've had a couple of people ask the same question, um, that they've heard that suppliers won't accept card payments. Is this true? How do you, accept, how do you get them to accept cards? So we have a database of suppliers and we know who is willing to accept card and who doesn't. Um, a lot of suppliers, yeah, many suppliers won't accept card. Uh, a lot of them are set up and their processes are such that that's just easy and, and makes more sense for their business. We found your more transactional suppliers, maybe the ones you don't have negotiations with or long-term relationships with, those just make sense to pay by card because you benefit from it. They get paid sooner and your accounts are cleared much sooner and it's easier to go. So we found there's quite a few and even if it's a small portion of suppliers, it's, it's an important piece um, who accept card. Thank you. Uh, our next question is, do you have any tips for building a business case for payment automation? Yeah, I think it's important to consider the cost that I walked through. So looking at every payment method, going along the cost and the risks associated with those different payment methods. And really, I'll get back to it, collaborate and engage deeply with Treasury and Procurement. They have a lot of insights and needs that will help guide you in, in taking that kind of holistic payment strategy. And then once you've started down that path, you'll start to develop, okay, here's the business case. You can identify the benefits, you can identify the costs and the risks, and you can really make the case to your CFO or to whoever in terms of automation and, and finding the right solution partner. Okay, let's see here. Um, someone's asking, is the virtual card payment the same as ePay? It can be. So there are many different flavors. And a lot of companies that are providing a, a, a payment service or an electronic payment service will, will have different approaches. Envoice Pay is a little unique because we offer every type of payment method based on what your supplier supplier's preferences are and what your preferences are. Um, where many solution providers, they really just focus on, on paying by card or outsourcing your other payment types. So you've got to look carefully at some of the economics and some of the more kind of detailed considerations when looking at different types of virtual card or ePay programs. Um, we have a question. Someone's asking, do you work with government entities? Yes, we, we do make payments to government entities as well. Okay. Um, let's see here. Uh, someone's saying, a few years back, we started offering our suppliers a a ACH through our bank. We now have 85% of our payments via ACH. Is there any hope of converting suppliers to card? Yeah. It, I mean, that's, that's a common scenario that we hear. Uh, many companies I've talked to and have seen even went down the ACH path, and a lot of them ended up regretting it and reverting back to check. And so we've seen companies go from having a, a similar, almost all ACH program to going back to check because they realized just how difficult the ACH program was to manage and maintain and how much easier check was. And we all know check is already super expensive. And so if you, if you have a solution provider who will have that conversation with, with your supplier on your behalf, you won't have to put, go through the extra effort of approaching the supplier and giving them those options of continuing on ACH or taking a check or accepting card. Plus, with a good solution provider, such as Invoice Pay, they already have a database and be able to guide you to where those supplier payment preferences are. Thank you. Our next question is, if we move to ACH or virtual cards and want to take advantage of early payment discounts, who negotiates the terms? So what we typically see is procure the procurement department negotiates the early payment terms. But some of the research that IOFM's come out with and has done in some of their surveys that I found interesting was that 80% of suppliers would be willing to accept early payment terms, but are only, only receiving it from about 20% of their customers. And the, the research fur, further showed that it was because in talking with procurement, procurement didn't trust that AP would necessarily be able to execute on the early payment terms, and procurement also didn't want to 
commingle the early payment conversations in the rest of the contract negotiations. And I think it's an interesting place that AP can take a, like I've said before, a more strategic approach in, in, in being proactive to work with procurement to really set goals in the AP department or set more, more visible, more uh, manageable levels of meeting early payment terms and, and, and really being held accountable to that but also even engaging the supplier AP or finding a solution partner who will engage the supplier to negotiate those terms on your behalf might be a great way to go. Thank you. Our next question, someone's asking, how much earlier do you need to pay when using a virtual card? So what, we, what I mentioned before was the, the check float is usually about three to five days. You actually pay the same time, so you approve the payment, it takes five days to get to the supplier. Virtual card is next day. So the, you lose about three to five days of check float, but you're making the payment, approving the payment all at the same time, getting credit for that payment. So you can still follow, or even maybe even pay a little bit later than you normally do off your, your invoice terms. Thank you. Our next question, why should we use a third, a third-party payment service and not a bank for ACH? Yeah, I think that's a great question and that's really what I've always been interested in understanding better. Banks don't care about your data. Um, they're definitely not going to guarantee that the data is secure and that your payments won't go to the wrong people. Um, a good third-party provider such as Invoice Pay will make those kind of guarantees and will protect your data and will even hold bad payments um, hold themselves accountable to bad payments. Banks aren't willing to accept that risk. They don't even want the risk of having your supplier's bank information in their systems. Um, another reason is the banks, they wanna charge you every time you pick up the phone, every time you ask them to do something that's outside of their process, they wanna charge you some pretty sizable fees. And those fees can add up quick. Um, rather than being supportive and collaborative and enabling your suppliers for you, they just wanna charge you every time they have to do something. Thank you. Um, we have time for a couple more questions. Um, someone's asking suppliers don't don't like the merchant fees for virtual cards. Any suggest, suggested workarounds? Yeah, some suppliers don't like the merchant fees and some have policies in place not to accept virtual card because of the merchant fees. That's part of the solution we provide. So we provide suppliers with options depending on what their policies are, what their internal processes are, and what they see as the benefits in terms of receiving earlier payment or rich remittance information. And we, we go through the hassle of figuring all that, all that for you, and we have a database and hundreds of thousands of suppliers in our database in history with suppliers to determine that and, and, and make a more informed decision than you might be able to on your own with the limited time you have. Excellent. It well, looks like that was our final question. Um, I do Great. have a few house, housekeeping notes to go over, um, but I want to thank Mark and, and Josh for a great webinar today. Um, if there were, if anyone has any other questions, you can email webinars at iofm.com, and we'll make sure to get those over to, to Mark and Josh. Um, as a reminder, many of you have asked about the on-demand version of today's webinar. Everyone will receive an email within two business days with a link to today's recording of the live webinar and a PDF of today's presentation. So please look for that in your inbox within the next two business days. Also, if you could please fill out the short evaluation form that will appear once you close out of the webinar um, so that we can uh, better serve your needs in future webinars, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, thank you again to Mark and Josh for a great webinar today. And thank you to all of our attendees for taking the time out of your busy day to join us. Again, this webinar was brought to you by IOFM and sponsored by Envoice Pay. Uh, thank you all and have a great rest of your day.